Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. allowed us to come together for his worship service this morning. Concerning our men's meeting, men should meet in room 108 with Brother Barnes following worship this morning. Men, meet with Brother Barnes. He has some special information for you. Continued prayers for Sister McLean. Our latest class will be this Sunday, February 20th, from 5 to 6 p.m. by way of Zoom. So make yourself available. And there are numbers that I, that I can give you to call and dial the numbers. And we can dial number 301-715-8592. You, know, you don't want to write this down, but I'll have it. Enter ID number 847-077-68-2568 and key in the passcode. Passcode is 529492. For access, also, you are invited to contact the church office or to contact one of the, one of the brothers, Brother Shields and some, some of our men. Our men's class will be Sunday, February 27th at the same time this afternoon. Special prayers are requested for Sister Annie Morrell. Continued prayers for Sister Regina Williams and family. We ask special prayers for Brother McLean's son-in-law, Dewan Hightower, whose mother passed away. Prayers for the health of Sister McLean's uncle, Brother John Ross. Keep him in your prayers. Prayers for the health of Brother Kevin Edmondson and his family and Cl Brother Clarence Edmondson and all of those members in that family. Special prayers for Douglas, Brother Douglas McHenry. Brother McHenry requests prayer for himself and his daughter and family. Special prayers are requested for Sister Marilyn Stewart. Sister Marilyn Stewart, is, her health is challenged. We just pray for her and we, we, and we pray with her. We ask a special prayer for Sister Doris Smith and her family. Sister Smith has always, always asked prayers for herself and her family and her sons and, and their families. So we pray for them and we pray with them. Special prayers for Sister Pam Ely and family. Prayers for the health of her brother, Michael David. Sister Pam also uh, requests other prayers for other members of her family, and she's always, always being in prayer for them. She asks the church to be in prayer for them. We ask a special prayer for Sister Sheree Warner and her sister Sharon, and we just pray that she'll be blessed and she'll be cared, mended through the Lord's service. We just want to keep our prayers on the prayer lines open for Sister Warner. Sister Denise Draper has prayers for, her, for, for, her, for herself and her father. Prayers for the health of Sister Linda Knight. We also ask, sister, ask prayers for Sister Knight. Sister Knight is planning, anticipating about with surgery, and we pray for her and we pray with her. God is going to bless her. We trust that he will. As I said earlier, we ask prayers for Sister Angela Wright and her family, Brother Nate Wright. Sister Angela has, is having some 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 transportation she's having to travel back and forth from Texas for special, special treatment. So we, we want to pray for Sister and Brother Wright. Prayers for Sister McLean, Sister McLean and her family. Continued prayers for Sister McLean as she recuperates from surgery. Uh, I, I understand she, she was uh, aggressive to come to service this morning, but her, her, her health just wouldn't permit. Thank, we thank Brother McLean uh, that he's there for her, with her as her, as her caregiver, caretaker even her minister, as she has said to me. Continue prayers for Brother James Bentley's nephew, Keith, who is experiencing health challenges. We want to thank Brother Bentley for asking the church and, and continuing to stay with the church to pray for Keith. Continue to pray for those who have requested prayer for their health 
and those who are having or have had medical procedures. Continue prayers for those who have lost family members and those who are grieving, have grieved, and are still grieving about the loss of loved ones. Remember to pray for all our sick and shut in brothers and sisters, their families, and all of those administering to the health and care of our loved ones. Also continue prayers for our leadership here at the University Church and the entire body of Christ around the world. Thank God that he blesses those who love him in his church, and we just thank God for he'll continue to bless the University family, the Church of Christ family. On our roster this morning, we have myself, Brother Donald Nelson, called to worship. Brother Greg Shields, our song leader. Brother Bruce Johnson will bring us our meditation and scripture. Brother Nathaniel Wright will lead us in our devotional prayer. Brother Terrence McLean will bring our message to us today, from this, sent from the Lord. Thank you. Brother Frank Barnes will guide us in our communion service. I will return with our offering and announcements. Brother Ray Knight will serve as our benediction person. And for our response facilitator, we will count on Brother, Brother Amos Hicks. Message from the minister, God wants his church to grow. From Proverbs 29, 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. The need is for the kind of faith that sees great things being accomplished that has a positive, optimistic outlook. When leadership has vision that is born of faith, exciting things are going to happen. And where that doesn't exist, nothing's going to happen. God wants his church to grow. Thank you, Brother McLean, for that message. Let us go to God in prayer. Let us pray together. Our God, our Father in heaven, we thank you for calling your family together once again to study, to learn, to worship and praise you. Thank you, Lord, for having guided and directed us through the past days of our lives Thank you for watching over us and blessing us, keeping us safe, particularly blessing those members of our family who are sick and not well, particularly blessing those members of our family who've lost loved ones, particularly blessing those members of our family who are in for nursing medical facilities. Watch over them, Lord. Please bless them particularly blessing those members of our family who are at home and not well and not able to come out and worship with us. Bless, bless Brother and Sister Brown in a special way, Lord. And we just pray that you'll watch over and keep and protect and bless our family members. Now, Lord, we are called together to worship and serve you. We pray that our, our services will be pleasing and acceptable unto thee. We pray that our singing, we pray that our study in your word, we pray that our offering that we give into your treasury, we pray that our worship service will be pleasing unto you, dear Lord, and you will bless us. Help us now, Lord. Go with us. Go with our minister. Bless him in a special way with the words that he will bring forth from the gospel. In Jesus' name, let us all say, Amen. Let's say good morning, University uh, family, fa family, and and uh, and friends. Um, as we lift praises to God uh, on this morning, um, I want to encourage. I, I, I want to encourage you to just get something out of it for yourself for yourself as uh, as well and besides the message on this morning if you get nothing else out of this 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 couple of hours that we spend together um, let's get this song out of this couple of hours okay <clears throat> I know the Lord will find a way for me 
sing this song there's going to be there's going to be some trouble going on <clears throat> and i certainly don't want any trouble especially from, from 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 sister brown so uh you know sometimes you sing you sing songs or you don't sing songs because you don't want to uh you don't want people to get in trouble so if you did do what this song said be more than well you know you're more than welcome to sing this song uh i woke up this morning I, I, I woke up. I woke up this morning. I hope everybody woke up this morning. That way, that way, right, Sister Brown. <laughs> I woke up this morning with my mind. My mind it was staying on Jesus. Well, I I woke up this morning with my mind. My mind it was staying on the Lord. Well, I I woke up this morning with my mind. My mind it was staying on Jesus. 
Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, yeah. You know that we're walking and talking with the mind. My mind, it will stay on Jesus. Where well, we're walking and talking with a man, a man stayed on the Lord. Where well, we're walking and talking with a man, a man will stay on Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, yeah, you know that we're singing, pray it with a mind, a mind, stay it on Jesus, well, we're singing and pray it with a mind, a mind, stay it on the Lord, well, we're singing and pray it with a mind, a mind, stay it on on Jesus, hallelujah, 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 oh yeah, you know that I woke up this morning with my mind, my mind, it will stay it on Jesus, oh well, I, I woke up this morning with my mind, my mind, it will stay it on the Lord. Oh, well, I, I woke up this morning with my mind. My mind, he will stay it on Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Good morning, University. Good morning. I am before you with the meditation of the scripture. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, today's meditation will be taken from the book of Matthew, Matthew 13, 36 through 43. Go ahead, Bruce. It is found inside your informer, and it can also be found in, on the screen above my head. And it reads, then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, the good seeds are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. Yes, sir. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of the kingdom all things that are in, and them which do the And shall cast them into a furnace of fire, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of the Father. Who has ears to hear, let him hear. Amen. Amen. This morning's scripture reading will be taken from the book of Isaiah, mm -hmm. chapter 59, verses 1 through 8. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 59, 1 through 8. And the Bible reads, Behold, the Lord is, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue have muttered perverseness. 
None calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. They hatch cockatrice's eggs and weave the spider's web. Mm -hmm. He that eateth their eggs dieth, and that which is crushed breaketh out into a viper. Mm -hmm. Their web shall not become garments, neither shall they cover themselves with their work. Their works are works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hands. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their paths. In verse 8, the way of peace they know not, and there is no judgment in their goings. They have made them, them crooked paths. Whosoever goeth therein shall not know peace. I read to you from the book of Isaiah, chapter 59, verses 1 through 8. May the Lord add a blessing to those who hear, understand, and obey his holy and divine word. Now prepare your hearts to be led in prayer by Brother Nathaniel Wright. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrow I see billows roll, whatever my life thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul, with my soul. I is well, I it is well, oh, with my soul, oh, we can sing, I it is well, it is well, oh, with my soul, oh, with my soul, I it is well, it is well, oh, with my soul. Let us bow as we go before God in prayer. All wise and gracious Father in heaven, Father, we come before your throne of grace with thanksgiving and in praise unto you. Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us, for you allowed us to lay down last night in our beds. You allowed us to have a restful night's sleep. And you woke us up this morning, dear Lord. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. And you gave us the, the ability and the strength mm -hmm. to get up out of our beds and to do those little things that we so often take for granted. Yeah, mm -hmm. Father, we realize that all the things that we are able to do, our strength comes from you. Thank you, dear Lord, for all your blessings and for your grace and for your mercy. Most of all, dear Lord, thank you for your son, Jesus the Christ, and for the sacrifice that he made on behalf of all mankind. 
when he gave his life for the sins of the world. And we're so thankful, dear Lord, for the privilege to come before you and to say thank you and to give you praise, honor, and glory. Thank you, dear Lord, for the privilege to come together this morning as fellow Christians with kindred minds and kindred spirits, to come together to worship you and to worship you in spirit and in truth. Thank you, dear Lord, for, for your word and what it means in our lives. For we know that your word is able to save our souls if we are obedient to the things that you have commanded of us to do. Thank you for this gathering, dear Lord, and thank you for your continued blessings upon each and every one of us. And we just pray that each one of us, dear Lord, will endeavor to do the things that you have commanded, that through our lives you will be glorified. Thank you, dear Lord, for the one who will shortly come before us, and Brother McLean, who will bring forth your message unto us. And we pray that we will be receptive to the things that we hear, that we might follow those things and, and glorify you in our lives. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your grace. And dear Lord, we just come asking that you come continue to look up on us, continue to bless us. And Father, there are so many of, uh, of our body who cannot be here this morning with us, who are sick and, and afflicted. Be with them, dear Lord, and bless them and keep your arms of health and healing around them. There are just so many, and dear Lord, uh, that we cannot count all the ones who are not with us. But you know who they are. But we ask that you look up on uh, my daughter-in-law, Angela, who is, who is currently in the hospital, your Lord, and, and who will have to travel uh, to another state to get treatment for the affliction that she is dealing with. The cancer has returned to her body, and we just pray that uh, you will be with the doctors and the nurses and all of those caregivers who will be tending to her, that she might have a reasonable portion of health and strength restored to her. Thank you, dear Lord, for uh, the privilege to petition you. And we ask that you look up on Sister McLean and Sister Emma Brown and, and Sister Pam Ely. And there are so many others, dear Lord. And we will not attempt to name all of them, dear Lord. But we know that you know who they are. And we, and we petition you that you will be with them and keep your arms of healing around them. And restore them to a reasonable portion of health and strength. Continue to bless this congregation, dear Lord, and, and look up on uh, our leaders, our elders, and our deacons. Bless them, be with them, and guide them, dear Lord, in the way that you would have them to go. And that is according to your word, that we might grow as, as your body, and that we might spread your word to others who have not accepted your son as their Lord and Savior. Thank you, dear Lord, for the privilege to come before you to, to offer these uh, uh, petitions and to give prayers and praise unto you. For we recognize you, dear Lord, as King of King and Lord of Lords, who caused all things to come into existence. And we pray that we will just continue to bless you in our daily lives by doing those things that, that are pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Thank you, dear Lord, for the privilege to come before you just to say thank you and continue to bless us. We're just so thankful for your blessing, for your grace, and for your mercy. 
most of all, your son, Jesus the Christ. Mm -hmm. These and all blessings we do ask through Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Before we move forward to the next uh, scheduled song, um, I like the energy that was felt on that last, on that last song from the congregation. Um, Brother McLean, if you can go back to verse 4, verse 4 on that, uh, on, on that song, let's, let's try to sing that last, that last verse of, last verse of, it is well, it is well with, with my soul. I'm going to place on my heart that, you know, the, the Bible teaches us in John, it says, but the hour cometh and is, and now is that when the uh, true worship, worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and and in truth as we sing this song cover uh carry that thought into in, in, in into this song and lord it's the day the day shall be sung the cloud be rolled back as a scroll, the trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so. Sing 825, 825. I love my my Savior too. Uh, after which we're going to have a message from our own minister, Brother Terrence Terrence McLean. <clears throat> Jesus, my heavenly King, loves me. I know praises to Him I see on word. You know closely to Him I cling. Blessing still. Oh, I love my Savior too. Oh, well, I, I love my Savior. And he loves me. Yes, he loves me too. I, I sing his favor. Uh, in everything I do, you know we will walk with him each day. Love light does shine, uh, doing his will always, never. Somehow we're kneeling to him, I pray thy will not. Oh, I love my Savior too. Oh, come on, I, I love my Savior when he, he loves me. Yes, he loves me too. I, I sing his favor in everything 
I do. Oh, you know we're happy to serve my friend. Lean on his arm. Rapture will never end. Nothing. You know our voices will sweetly wonder. Yeah, I love my Savior too. Oh, well, I, I love my Savior and He loves me. Yes, He loves me too. Oh, I, I see His faith in grace and favor. Favor in everything, everything I do. Amen. I love my Savior too. If you love your Savior too, you ought to say amen. amen. If you are glad to be among the land of the living, you ought to say amen. amen. If you are glad to have the activity of your limbs and control of your mind, you ought to say amen. If you know that God has been better to you than you have been to yourself, yes, sir. Yes, sir. you ought to say amen. amen. We are thankful that God Almighty has allowed all of us the opportunity to come together and to worship him in spirit and in truth. We are thankful for the presence of all of you who are here in the auditorium, uh, especially those of you who are, are honored guests. We know you could have been somewhere else, but you've chosen to come and to worship God in spirit and in truth with us. Our prayer is that you will sense that God is in this place yes, and sir. that yes, we sir. are people who love the Lord. We endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. We believe there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who's above all, through all, and in us all. If you are watching on Facebook Live, thank you for joining us via social media. You may be watching later on YouTube, or you may be on the teleconference call. Thank you for joining us as we worship God in spirit and in truth. Uh, thank all of our brethren who have led us in various aspects of uh, worship. Thank you for joining in and praising God and being actively engaged in declaring what God is worth in our lives. I am grateful that God has now given me another opportunity to proclaim his holy and divine word and my desire is that God gets glory Jesus is lifted up saints of God are built up in the most holy and precious faith and that those of you who may not yet be Christians the Holy Spirit will take the word proclaim convict you of the salvation that's in Christ and in him alone if you have your Bibles turn to Isaiah chapter 59 verse 1 through 8, Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1 through 8. If you have it, say amen. amen. If you don't have it yet, say wait. I heard a wait there somewhere. Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1, 1 through 8. The King James Version reads this, this way. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue hath muttered perverseness. None calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. They hatch cockatrices' eggs and weave the spider's web. He that eateth of their eggs dieth, and that which is crushed breaketh out into a viper. Yes, their webs shall not become garments, neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hands. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. 
Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they know not. And there is no judgment in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Whosoever goeth therein shall not know peace. Verse 5 says, they hatch cockatrice eggs and weave the spider's web. Our subject this morning is weaving the spider web. Weaving the spider web. Pray with me. Gracious and eternal Father, we thank you for this day, for the blessings of life that you have given us. Thank you for the opportunity to come together, worship you. Our prayer is that our worship has been pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Thank you for all of the brethren who have led us in various aspects of worship and those who will follow me. It's only our desire to glorify you and to so lift up Jesus that all mankind will be drawn to the foot of the cross. Father, our prayers that those of us who are your children will gain strength by our time together. And that those who have not yet obeyed the gospel, please, Holy Spirit, take your word and convict them of the need of the salvation that's in Christ and in him alone. We join with Brother Nate Wright Sr. in praying for all of those that he prayed for. We know you are a prayer answering God. A special prayer for a special situation concerning his daughter-in-law, Angela. Please be with those who are ministering to her needs, be with her husband, Ken, as well as Brother Nate and Sister Marva and, and Nate Jr. and the rest of the family. Help them to remember that you are still in charge. And I ask a special dispensation of your grace upon my beloved wife, Linda, continue uh, to heal her body, touch her. We know she's in a great deal of pain. We know it was her desire to join us in service today. But we also realize the extent of that surgery she underwent on top of her other health challenges. And we just ask you to protect her, keep her safe. And may I find her well when I get home from service today. And Father, now as I proclaim your word, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Use me mightily. Forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Weaving the spider's web. While I was preparing this message, I watched some video of spiders. I don't want to see any in my house, but I did want to see them on the internet. And it showed a spider and elapsed time. That means they sped it up. And I got to watch how the spider wove their web. With its eight eyes, eight legs, and 4,000 holes in its body, the spider weaves the web. In the abdomen of the spider, there are six little spinning machines. Those six machines contain hundreds of little miniature spinning machines called spinnerets. Each little spinneret gives out a slender thread. He lays the foundation first for each little thread, a little gum-like substance is used as a foundation at the end of that little thread. Then he pulls his thread to the other extremity and lays the foundation on the other side. He puts up his scaffolding first and builds the exterior, the circumference, then he fills it in. He has a little fluid that he empties on the little microscopic threads and that fluid is sticky so when a fly comes and hits on the spider's web, he's stuck. But the little spider periodically places one thread that has no sticky fluid so he can get to the fly without getting stuck himself. The spider then goes to a dark corner and hides. And yet he has from every thread in the web another thread going to him under his foot. 
So when a fly hits on the web, he feels one particular thread move under his foot, and he immediately knows the location of the fly in the web. The spider goes down one of the little threads that has no fluid on it, uses his two fangs to inject poison into his prey, and then brings it back. But their webs have other uses. Not only do they catch prey, but they store food. Escape from danger, make egg sacs and nurseries, create hibernation areas to survive cold winters and communicate through vibration signals that they send on the silk strands. But with all of that said, a spider's web is very frail. It is curiously wrought but not enduringly manufactured. And so as we look at Isaiah chapter 59, Israel's condition was that way in the text. Their works were like the web of the spider, a reference to the tenuity and gossamer character of the web. And verse 5 says, and they weave the spider's web. Their purposes were as flimsy and unsubstantial as the web of the spider. And the unsubstantial fabrics which they weave shall not serve them any way as garments. Clark in his commentary says, quote, weave the spider's web. By their plots they weave nets. They lay snares industriously with great pains and artifice whereby they may entangle and involve their poor neighbors in intricacies and perplexities and so devour them as the spider weaves her web to catch flies and then to feed on them. Verse number 6 of the text declares that their webs shall not become garments, neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hands. Literally, their works are works of nothingness, works that make a mere pretense of being works at all, and in reality, they are mere shams, they are impotent, and they are delusive. Isaiah postulates that God is not less able than he was in times of old. But he says his hand has lost none of its power. He does not help is owing to the iniquities of his people which have separated between him and them in verse number 2. It is the same fact which has made his ear heavy. It has separated, literally have been separating. And the force of the form used is continuous and implies that Israel had for a long time been heaping up a barrier between itself and Jehovah. Their sins had made him avert his face from them. God was still as able to help as ever. His power is not at all lessened. Whether we consider the extent of his power or the efficacy of it, God can reach as far as ever and with as strong a hand as ever. Neither length of time nor strength of enemies nor weakness of instruments can shorten or straighten the power of God for which it is all one to save by many or to save by few. He was still ready to hear their prayers, but there was a spiritual disconnect because of their sins. What was the bill of indictment that is here drawn up against them? They were many and they were varied, yet any one of them was enough to separate between them and a just and a holy God. Verse number 7, it says, their thoughts were thoughts of iniquity. Their imaginations were continually evil. Their projects and designs were continually contriving some mischief or another. They conceived mischief in their purpose, in their counsel, in their resolution, which brought forth iniquity according to verse number 4. In verse 5 it is said that they hatched cockatrice eggs and they weave the spider's webs. Their thoughts were vain, like weaving the spider's web, which though he takes a great deal of pain to construct is a weak and insignificant thing. Their thoughts were malicious and spiteful. They hatch the eggs of the cockatrice or the adder which are poisonous and produce venomous creatures. Such are the thoughts of the wicked who delight in doing mischief. 
Even the spider's web which they wove was woven with a spiteful design to catch flies and make a prey of them. But secondly, out of this abundance of wickedness in the heart, their mouth speaks. And yet it does not always speak out the wickedness that is within, but it is couched within and covered by much fair speech. They, they talk smoothly, but their words were deceitful. Verse 3 says, your lips have spoken lies. Verse 4 says, and continue to speak lies. They pretended kindness where they intended the greatest maliciousness. By slanders and false accusations, they blasted the reputation of those that they had in order against. Sound familiar? In verse 3, the text declares that your tongue has muttered perverseness. The Hebrew word used means perverseness or wickedness or dishonesty or wrong or injustice or unrighteousness or depravity. It implies that when they could not speak their malice openly, for fear of being disproved, they muttered it secretly. Thirdly, their actions grew out of their thoughts and their words. Verse 3 says, your hands are defiled with blood. Verse 7 informs us their feet run to evil and they make haste to shed innocent blood. As if they were afraid of losing the opportunity to do this barbarous thing. This was done naturally and eagerly, hurried on by the impetus of their malice and their desire for revenge. Verse 7 continues saying, wasting and destruction are in their paths. Wherever they went, they carried their pernicious ways with them. Their tendency was to lay waste and destroy, and they did not care what havoc they made. They wronged people and made everything their own. Verse 4 says they trust in vanity. They attached themselves, and they felt safe and secure and depended upon their strategies that were designed to enrich them and hurt others. This, however, proved vanity to them, and their deceiving others led to their own self-deception. Verse number 6 says, their works are works of iniquity. Their whole business was one continued course of oppressions, and the act of violence is in their hands. Not a pretty picture, is it? Now remember, these are God's people. Fourthly, there was nothing done to redress these grievances nor to reform these abuses. Verse 4 says, none calleth for justice nor pleadeth for truth. None complains of the violation of the sacred laws of justice nor seeks to right those that suffer wrong or get the laws put in execution against vice and profaneness and those lewd practices which were the shame and threatened to be the bane of the nation of Israel. Truth was opposed, and there was not any that pled for it. Not any that had the conscience and the courage to appear in defense of an honest cause and to confront fraud and wrongdoing. Verse number 8 says the way of peace was as little regarded as the way of truth. Everywhere they went, they caused trouble. Everywhere they went, they caused confusion. Hello. They know it not, they don't study peace, and they don't study the things that make for peace. They are utter strangers to everything that looks quiet and peaceable and affect that which is blustering and turbulent. There is no sense of justice in their dealings. And then fifthly, those that practice iniquity trust in vanity, which will certainly deceive them in verse 4. Their webs which they weave with so much art and industry shall not become garments. Neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Verse 6. There is nothing of value resulting from sin. And so it will appear when profit and loss come to be compared. Those paths of iniquity in verse 8 are crooked paths. 
which will perplex them but never bring them to their journey's desired end. Whoever follows their paths, though they say they shall have peace, is deceiving their own selves. But that's Israel. What about modern man? Modern 21st century man has forgotten that sin still separates from God. Sin separates us from fellowship with God. You all don't have to say amen. I got some in my pocket. During the 20th century, the year is 1996 to be exact, there, there was a prayer given during the opening session of the Kansas Senate that caused an uproar from some of the elected officials. The minister's name is Joe Wright, and the following is the actual transcript of what the minister prayed, read by Paul Harvey and included on the website of American Rhetoric Online Speech Bank. So that's where I got it from. These are his exact words. Heavenly Father, we come before you today to ask your forgiveness and to seek your direction and guidance. We know your word says, woe to those who call evil good, and that's exactly what we've done. We've lost our spiritual equilibrium. We've inverted our values. We confess that we've ridiculed the absolute truth of your word in the name of moral pluralism. We've worshiped other gods with a little g and called it multiculturalism. We've endorsed perversion and called it alternative lifestyle. We've exploited the poor and called it a lottery. We've neglected the needy and called it self-preservation. We've rewarded laziness and called it welfare. Father, in the name of choice, we have killed our unborn, and then in the name of right to life, we've killed abortionists. We've neglected to discipline our children and called it building esteem. We have abused power and called it political savvy. We have coveted our neighbor's possessions and called it taxes. We have polluted the air with profanity and pornography and called it freedom of expression. We've ridiculed the time-honored values of our forefathers and called it enlightenment. Search us, O oh God, and know our hearts today. Try us and show us any wickedness in us and then cleanse us from every sin and set us free. Guide and bless these men and women who have been sent here by the people of Kansas and who have been ordained by you to govern this great state. Grant them your wisdom to rule, and may their decisions direct us to the center of your will. I ask it in the name of your Son, the living Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now that sounds like a good prayer to me, Brother Frank. A scriptural prayer. Y'all got quiet. But no sooner has their guest chaplain concluded his prayer, and three elected officials on the state legislature are on their feet at their microphones protesting. First one said, he can't talk like that about us. The second one called the invocation gross, derisive, sanctimonious, and overbearing. The third one called it blasphemous and ignorant. And the fourth one echoed the indignation. Church, I stop by to remind you that not much has changed since 1996. If you pay attention to our legislature and what's going on in our country, you can pray this exact prayer verbatim and it still be accurate. You see, we live in a day and time when sin is no longer ugly. Sin is no longer putrefying. 
Isaiah says in Isaiah 53 and verse 5 that it is a putrefying disease. Psalm 38 verse 4 through 6 says it is a heavy burden. Proverbs 13 15 says it's a hard taskmaster. A defiling fifth is filth is what it's called. In 2 Peter 2 verse 20 through 22. Jesus said in Matthew 6 verse 12, Matthew 6 verse 14, and Matthew 6 verse 15 that it is a binding debt. And the psalmist said in Psalm 51 1, it is a blemishing stain. Sin is nothing for us to celebrate. Someone said, what is sin? I'm glad you asked that question. An anonymous author put it this way, man calls it an accident, God calls it an abomination. Man calls it a blunder, God calls it a blindness. Man calls it a defect, God calls it a disease. Man calls it a chance, God calls it a choice. Man calls it an error, God calls it enmity. Man calls it a fascination, God calls it a fatality. Man calls it an infirmity, God calls it iniquity. Man calls it a luxury, God calls it leprosy. Man calls it a trifle, God calls it a tragedy. Man calls it a mistake, God calls it madness. Man calls it a weakness, God calls it willfulness. However, I stop by to remind you today, the imminent danger facing the church is more than about morals and Christian ethics. Satan still weaves the spider web designed to snare the unsuspecting child of God and precious souls who have yet to name the name of Christ. I postulate to you today that some innocent soul every day is drinking from the cup of damnable doctrine. Every day someone takes the alcohol of atheistic attitudes. Every day somebody is inhaling the foul air, air of spiritual stagnation. Every day our churches are feeling the pressure of do your own thing-ism and touching the borders of having your own way allergy. I want to remind you today that false doctrine will contaminate the word, it will corrupt the church, it will desecrate the doctrine, it will dethrone God, it will reject Christ and ridicule the cross. Our adversary, the devil, is still weaving a spider web of deceit. And there are some people who want to change anything and everything in the church that they don't agree with without counting the consequences. Others are determined to destroy the church as we know it and just make it another denomination. These, quote, change agents have an agenda that is nothing more than weaving the spider web. There is a book written by William Woodson among us as brothers in Christ entitled Change Agents and the Churches of Christ. And he says there are at least 10 affirmations about the members of the Church of Christ that need to be changed. First thing he says is that we have misunderstood grace. I don't know about him or everybody else. I don't believe I've misunderstood grace. I believe Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of work. Lest any man should boast. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace is receiving that that we do not deserve. And mercy is the withholding of the just punishment that we do deserve. I understand stand great for Titus 2 verse 11 says for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works I understand grace. Grace happened out there on Calvary, on the cross in which Jesus died. 
They're trying to tell us now baptism for the remission of sins is not necessary for salvation. I beg to differ with them because it was Jesus who said, and if you have a good Bible, it's in red, R-E-D, and I hope that you read R-E-A-D, the R-E-D in your Bible in Mark 16, 15, 16, when he said, go ye therefore and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. In Acts chapter 2, when Peter preached the first gospel sermon on the first Pentecost, following the resurrection of Jesus Christ, told him about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. The Bible says when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts, and they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter answered and said unto them, in verse 38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins and you shall you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost in other words you don't get the Holy Ghost until you have received the remission of sins and you don't get the remission of sins until you're buried in water for the remission of sins they say we don't understand that salvation is by grace alone and faith only. I know it's by grace. I know it's by faith. But Romans 6, 17 says, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin. What he says is that when you obey with the proper understanding the form of doctrine, which he had said earlier in Romans 6, is baptism, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ, then and only then are you free from sin. But Romans 10, 16 says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our, our report? They say the Church of Christ is a denomination among denominations. When you talk about something being a denomination, you're saying that it is a part of something bigger than itself. And I maintain that the scriptures say the Church of Christ is not a denomination, not a part of a bigger whole. The Church of Christ is the church that belongs to Christ. Matthew chapter 16, verse number 18, after Jesus had asked them, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? They said, some say that thou or Jeremiah, so Elijah or Jeremiah, or one of the prophets, but whom say ye that I am? And Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus looked at Peter and said, Blessed art thou, Simon by Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Not not a part of the whole I'm going to build the whole I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it I will die go down into the Hadean world come back from the dead and build my church because I don't want man to put his cotton picking hands on my church Acts chapter 2 verse 47 after they heard what Peter said says they were praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved what church did he add them to the only one that existed the one he promised to build in Matthew chapter 16 the one that was established in the top of the mountains and in the top of the hill in the city of Jerusalem and that all nations would flow unto the one that Paul said in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 22 and 23 talking about Jesus has put all things under his feet God the Father has put under God the Son all things under his feet gave him to be the head over all things to the church which is his body the fullness of him that filleth all in all in Ephesians 5 it says there is one body There are those who say that because we don't use instrumental music 
And there are other people who do use instrumental music that that should not be a barrier to fellowship, but I've got a problem. Brother Greg Shields, our excellent song leader and one of our elders made mention of this very text. I said, oh wow, he's gonna preach my sermon. When Jesus was there with the woman at the well from Samaria, disciples had gone into the city in order to buy meat. They had a conversation and Jesus said, give me something to drink. And she said, what do you mean? Give you something to drink. Don't you know that Jews and Samaritans have no dealings one with another? You all say in Jerusalem is where men ought to worship. And my father said in this mountain is where men ought to worship. And Jesus said, you don't know what you worship. We know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jew. And then he said to her, but the hour cometh and now he is when the true worshiper shall worship the father in spirit and in truth. For the father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit and they that worship him must. Not optional. They must worship them in spirit and in truth. You see, there's some of us who worship in truth, but not in spirit. And then there are those in the religious world who worship in spirit, but not in truth. Jesus said they both have to go together. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, 15, what is it then? I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit. I will sing with the understanding also. He didn't say I will play or I will pluck or I will toot or I will bang. He said I will sing. He was specific. And just in case you missed it, he wrote to the Christians at Ephesus in chapter 5, verse 18. You want to know how to be filled with the Spirit? First of all, he says, and be not drunk with, with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the... And what that means is let the Holy Spirit control you. And the way the Holy Spirit controls you is through the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. The more of the Word you obey, the more the Holy Spirit has control of your life. Be not drunk with wine, wearing his excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves. And psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. They say that our services need some refreshing by the Holy Spirit. No, we don't need no refreshing. You just need to change your attitude about worship. Too many people are leaving the Lord's church on, but I didn't get nothing out of it. I dare anybody. To show me the scripture where God ever told you to get something out of worship. He told you to put something in it. He told you to sing. He told you to pray. He told you to hear the word. He told you to give. He told you to partake of the Lord's Supper. It's not what you get out of worship. What are you putting in? And if you do what the Bible says, you'll be filled with the Spirit. Ain't no way in the world Brother Greg can get up here and sing his heart out and you sit there like a bump on a dill pickle and it don't move you. Not if you're putting something in. I don't care if you can't hold a tune in a bucket. Sing loud. And if somebody looks at you funny, sing louder. He didn't say you had to be Marvin Gaye or Beyonce in order to praise him. In fact, when Jesus went in the city of Jerusalem and they were crying Hosanna to the king, they told him, tell these folks to stop praising you. And Jesus said, if they shut up, the rocks are going to cry out. I don't know about you, but I don't want no rocks out on East 89th Street giving praise to God that I ought to be giving to him.
they say that there are some core doctrines and we need to well, forget about all the other stuff y'all talking about. And I got a problem with that because Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scriptural writings, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Pasa agrafe theopanustos. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And then they say, you know what, well, you, you, you folk in the church cry, y'all just don't get it. Y'all need to have something hit you in the top of the head and go down to the soles of your feet. And then you'll know you got the Holy Spirit. Now I read Ephesians 6.17 that tells me that part of my armor as a child of God is to take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And you know there's something about this Word of God. Far too many times, Brother Amos, I hear folks say, oh, you know, the Bible is dull. Well, that's not what Hebrews 4.12 says. It says, for the word of God is quick. That word means it's alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. See, some of y'all are mad right now. Because of some of the scriptures I'm quoting. Brother McClain up there talking about me. No, no, the word of God is just finding you where you are. I don't spend my life looking in your window. <laughs> I'm not no PI, private investigator, to follow you around everywhere you go. And to hear everything you say. And look at everything you do. But the Holy Spirit will take this word. And convict you of your sin. They say we ought to fellowship those in denominations because they are brothers in Christ. How can you be a brother in Christ if you are not in Christ? Yeah. Hello. Paul wrote in Ephesians 5, verse 6 through 11, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the other unfruitful works of darkness but rather reprove them now that's what my bible says and you know I, I, I couldn't finish this sermon without this one women taking over the world yeah, yeah. sisters y'all can say amen Now they shouldn't be, but they are. So now there are those who say, we ought to unloose women and put them in leadership positions in the Lord's church. We've held them back too long. Now if you close your eyes while I'm talking, I might sound like a woman. Greg said, amen. <laughs> but I'm not no woman. Y'all laughing, but I, I recall some members, they were telling folks about coming to the church, and these people had heard me on our radio program and said, what you talking about? Y'all got a woman preacher? <laughs> no, no, no. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, 34, let your women... Keep silence in the churches. 
For it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. I didn't get a lot of amens on that one, Frank. Okay, maybe, maybe you all, that's, that's not enough scripture for you. Okay, 1 Timothy 2 verse 11 says, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Let me help you. Because I had a brother say to me in this past week, he said, well, you know, if an eldership gives them permission to participate in public assembly, are they usurping authority? And I said, no, they're not usurping authority, but those elders don't have the authority to give them the authority to do that. Because this verse says, first of all, she is not to teach a man. Y'all quiet. The second thing, nor to usurp authority over the man. Those are two different things. Don't teach in a public setting that involves men. And then, if they don't give it to you, don't take the authority on your own. But to be in silence. Why is that, Paul? For Adam was first formed. Did y'all get that? Adam was first formed, and then Eve. A few years ago, sister came up to me and she said, I got a joke for you, Brother McLean. When God created man from the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul, God looked at him and said, I can do better than created woman. <laughs> and I said to her, I don't think that's what that text implies. Adam was first formed. Then Eve. And then the next verse says, and Adam was not deceived. Is that in your Bible? But the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved and childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. That's Bible. The only solution for sin, all that we're going through is Jesus Christ. The Lord saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Not only was the state of God's people bad, but no one among them took the lead in getting it right. Where was the man who would lead the people in righteousness? He could not be found. Where was the intercessor who would plead God's case to the people and the people's repentance to their God? No intercessor could be found. Who would deliver man from Satan, the insidious weaver of the spider web? Church, I just want to tell you, after all of the centuries of his tenure, Satan is still Satan. He is still the father of lies, John 8, 44. He is still the deceiver, Revelation 12, 9. He is still the adversary going about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, 1 Peter 5, 8. He is not given up in his determination to ensnare both the Christian and the church in his spider web. He seeks to destroy the church through confusion and division. Don't believe that the personality conflicts in our congregations are accidental. 
Don't believe that the power struggles are just manifestations of ambitions that have gotten out of hand. Don't believe that for one moment that the mysterious, malicious rumors are just symptomatic of overactive imaginations. Don't think that proposals to introduce elements foreign to the scriptures, into the work and worship of the church, are simply the signs of zealous persons attempting to breathe new life into the church. These, in fact, constitute some of the strands of Satan's spider web designed to destroy God's work, to crush the spirit of God's people, and to obscure the vision and divert attention from the heavenly mission. Our heavenly father knows all of this, and so his own arm brought salvation for him. In Isaiah 59, verse 20 and 21, it says, And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. The Redeemer will come to Zion. The Goel, or the kinsman Redeemer, will come. And the Goel, or kinsman Redeemer, had a specifically defined role in Israel's family life. The kinsman Redeemer was responsible to buy a fellow Israelite out of slavery, Leviticus 25, 48. He was responsible to be the avenger of blood to make sure the murderer of a family member answered to the crime, Numbers 35 and verse number 19. He was responsible to buy back family land that had been forfeited, Leviticus 25, 25. And he was responsible to carry on the family name by marrying a childless widow, Deuteronomy 25, verse 5 through 10. In these, we see that the Goal, or the kinsman redeemer, was responsible to safeguard the persons, the property, and the posterity of the family. Our redeemer, our Goel, is none other than Jesus Christ. He is our kinsman because he has added perfect humanity to his deity. He is the one who buys us out of slavery. He is the one who avenges wrong done to us. He protects our inheritance and blesses and guards our posterity. How does he do it? Psalm 85 verse 10 says that mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. What he does is that he reminds us that righteousness and peace came and come through Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. We sing a song at the cross. At the cross, where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away it was there by faith I received my sight and now I'm happy all the day above and beyond all questionable doubt the cross became and still is the greatest of all meeting places it is the crossroads of human civilization. It is where a holy God meets a sinful man and forgives him. It is where a just God meets an unjust man and justifies him. It is where a loving God meets a lonely man and comforts him. It is where a merciful God meets a miserable man and blesses him. It is where an omnipotent God meets a sick man and heals him. It is where a righteous God meets a carnal man and sanctifies him. And it is where a compassionate God meets a desperate man and delivers him. But I'm reminded that there were three crosses at Calvary. There was a cross on the left, a cross on the right, and then there was a cross in the middle. The cross on the left will take as the thief that died without Jesus. The cross on the right will take it as that thief that died with Jesus. And the cross in the middle is nobody other than Jesus. 
On the cross on the left, a man died in folly. On the cross on the right, a man died in favor. But in the cross in the middle, a man died in fulfillment. On the cross on the left, a man died a mocker. On the cross on the right, a man died in mercy. But on the cross in the middle, a man died as Messiah. On the cross on the left, a man died hassling. On the cross on the right, a man died in hope. But on the cross in the middle, a man died a high priest. On the cross on the left, a man died a knave. On the cross on the right, a man died in kindness. But on the cross in the middle, a man died king of kings. On the cross on the left a man died a liar, on the cross on the right a man died a lover, but on the cross in the middle a man died Lord of Lords, on the cross on the left a man died in sin, on the cross on the right a man died from sin, but on the cross in the middle a man died for sin. On the cross on the left a man died reeling, on the cross on the right a man died rejoicing, but on the cross in the middle a man died the rose of Sharon. On the cross on the left a man died a sinner, on the cross on the right a man died a saint, but on the cross in the middle a man died a savior. On the cross on the left a man died in pain, on the cross on the right a man died plea, but on the cross in the middle a man died the prince of peace, the resurrected savior and Lord. Lord. Listen, Satan continues to weave his spider web. But we have truth. And Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth. And the truth shall set you free. We usually quote that verse, John 8, 31, but we don't go to the next verse. He says, and if the Son set you free, you shall be free indeed. Don't you want to be freed from the guilt of your past sins? Free from the punishment for your past sins? Live this life free from the power of sin. That's what sanctification is. And then one day go to heaven free from the very presence of sin. That's what glorification is. If you're here today and you're not a child of God, if you are caught in Satan's spider web, you need to hear the gospel. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Romans 10 verse 17. You need to believe that gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ on the third day according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 through 4. Jesus said to John 8, 24, except you believe that I am he, meaning I am the Messiah, I am the Savior, I am your only hope. Except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins and where I am you cannot come. Are you willing to repent of your sins, change your mind, change your will, change your actions, ex Acts 17 and 30, in the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Confess with the mouth that Jesus Christ is God's Son, Romans 10, verse 9 and 10. And then, yes, you must be buried, baptized in water for the remission of your sins. If you're watching... And you need to contact us so we can help you connect with someone who will help you in your obedience to the gospel. We'll do that. Yes, if you're in this auditorium, the water's already ready. Right. The clothes are ready. You can go down in that water and come up a new creature. Old things will be passed away and behold, all things will become new. And those of you who are members of the Lord's church, are you caught in the spider web? Are you caught in this new theology? Or what they call the new hermeneutic? Brother Lonnie Stewart, he's still 80-something years old, and, and we still talk. He calls me, Brother Frank, I call him. He was one of the elders at Westside Church of Christ. We've stayed in touch all these years. And I remember he preached a sermon one time that said, if it's new, it ain't true. <laughs> and if it's true, it ain't new. 
And I say a hearty amen to that. We're going to stand and sing, Restore My Soul. This is your opportunity to come right now. Restore my spirit, Lord, I, I need, need you. Restore. My heart is weary. My heart is weary. Please help me, Please dear Lord. Please help me, dear Lord. I stand in need of. I stand in need of more. Strength from, from your word. Renew my love. Renew my love. Rebuild my faith Oh, oh restore, restore my soul Revive the fire, Lord fire, Lord Deepen my soul Stir my desire Stir my desire To work in to your To work in your full Yes, in in my in heart, heart, God. In my heart Dear God, your seal grown cold. Renew my love. My love. Rebuild my, my faith. Oh, restore, restore my, soul. my soul, Lord, my and courage. renew my courage, Lord. It needs restored. It needs restored. My cup is empty. My cup is empty. Refill it, dear Lord. Yes, and replace all doubts and fears with faith with so bold. Faith so bold. Renew, Renew my love. Renew my love. Rebuild my, my faith. faith. Oh, restore my soul. Amen. We're thankful to God for blessing all of us with the opportunity to come together. Thank you for being here. My prayer is that God has been pleased with the message that he has gotten glory, that Jesus has been lifted up. Saints of God are definitely encouraged, inspired, strengthened, built up in the most holy and precious faith, and that those of you who may not yet be children of God, that the Holy Spirit will take the word of God, the sword of the Spirit, and convict you of the need of the salvation that's in Christ and in him alone. Uh, just so that all of you are aware, before I turn it over to, to Brother Kicks, uh, I will be having surgery on Wednesday. Uh, they say that I will be hoarse. They are going into my neck. Uh, they found a way to silence me. <laughs> uh, I have what is called hyperparathyroidism and so the calcium levels are continuing to uh, grow in my body and it can affect other aspects of my health so the only way they can get it taken care of is to take out these small glands that they tell me are no bigger than a grain of rice brother Donald but everybody has four of them if they haven't been taken out. And, uh, so they're going to be taking those out, which means I won't. I'll probably be hoarse next weekend. So we've already talked with the elders. One of the elders will be um, teaching class on Thursday night. I will be taping Wednesday night's class ahead of time. Uh, surgery is on Wednesday. So when you see me on Facebook Live Wednesday teaching, no that it is uh, Memorex and not live. It's Memorex and not live. On next Lord's Day, I promised Sister McLean I would not try to get up and preach. And one of God's great servants, Brother Kevin McHenry, minister of the Greater Heights Church of Christ, is going to fill the pulpit on next Lord's Day. So please uh, continue to keep uh, me in prayer, keep Sister McLean in prayer because she's still recuperating from her surgery but God is able God is going to see us through I have no doubt about it for all of you Christians remember to do something that only a Christian would do and whether you're Christian or not remember God loves you Jesus died for you I love you and I am your servant for Jesus sake brother Hicks church say amen
see if we can escape from the web. I have a couple of uh, prayer requests. Sister Ebony Beckwith is asking for prayer. She wants to pray for her family, her daughters who have strayed from Christ, her husband and his relationship with his family, her son and his relationship with Christ and his efforts in school. Sister Ruth Wade is asking for prayer for herself, for her family, uh, keep her in prayer, also her grandson, uh, Benson Toller Jr. and uh, her husband William. Sister Linda Knight is asking for prayer for continued prayers for her health. So I don't have a card, but I'm going to ask for prayer for Sister McLean and her health issues. Let us go to God in prayer. Well, Heavenly Father, our Savior and our God, we come before you recognizing that you are the only one that can help us in our troubles. We have had some of our members recognize that they are caught in the web. Hmm they would like to escape. You are the only means of escape. Father, we ask that you would help Sister Beckwith. Mm -hmm. Help her, her daughters, her son, her husband. Make them ever mindful that any other way than your way keeps us in the web. Father, Sister Wade comes to us each week. She remembers that you are the only way. She prays for herself, for her family, for her husband. Father, we have a number of people that are having medical problems. Sister Linda Knight is asking for your intervention. I would ask it on behalf of Sister McLean and Brother McLean. Father, we all need you. You are our strength and our salvation. Father, be with us, continue to walk with us and talk with us, continue to guide us, to can continue to love us and to make us listen to your spirit, which will make sure that we love you. I'd like to thank you, Father, for the many blessings that we have. Especially, Father, I'd like to thank you for the long life that my mother has had. Wow. Thank you, Father, for blessing me even in times of trouble. Hmm. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus, because he's been the way out of trouble for all of us. We thank you for the great sacrifice that he has made. He has paid the debt that we owe. And through him, we pray for all things. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. As we move to, uh, to the close of our service on this, uh, on this afternoon, it's communion time. It, it, it's communion time. I, again, trust that you have secured your, um, your communion packet uh, with the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. If you have not, uh, one of the ushers will, uh, will, will 
get get a packet to you. In the meantime, let's sing um, where he leads me. I will follow. I will follow. <clears throat> I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling take thy cross and follow follow me where he leads me I will follow where he leads me he will follow where he leads me I will follow I'll go with him with him all the way God has blessed us to come to the part of the service where we have an opportunity to commune in remembrance of his son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, starting with verse number 23, for I have received of the Lord that which also I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he comes. Wherefore, whoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself not discerning the Lord's body. Heavenly Father, we bow before your throne of grace and mercy, thanking you once again for this opportunity to commune in remembrance of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, until he comes. Father, we pray that you will bless the bread and bless the fruit of the vine, and that we take this in a manner that is pleasing and acceptable in your sight. This is our prayer in your son Jesus' name. Amen. I'll go with him through the garden. I'll go with him through the garden I'll go with him through the garden I'll go with him with him all the way where he
like to thank Brother McClain for that timely lesson. We, weaving this right as well. Uh, enriching and fulfilling for all of us. Thank God for that message that was sent to us. Apostle Paul writing on 1 Corinthians to 16th chapter says, well, on the first day of the week, let every one of us lay by and store and give as God prospers us. Why? That there be no gatherings when I come. Mm -hmm. The commandment and the opportunity is to give. And uh, Apostle Paul just further gives us instructions on how we are to give. We, God blesses the church through its members and through its finances because we need to maintain the services here. And we thank God for enriching within a, in each one of us uh, the energies and the abilities, some of us jobs, some of us willingness, and some of us energies to go out and, and earn monies because monies are, are, are needed, monies are necessary. So we just thank God. This is a time that we wanna give as God has prospered us. God keeps on giving and we just thank him. Earlier, earlier, brother and in, in through brother McLean's message of God wants his church to grow. This is another way God helps his church to grow because through the resources, Heart to heart. Heart to heart is a resource that has been given to the, to the, to the church, to the Lord, through University Church. And we, we, reach, we send them out through, through the members and then we send them out to, to the neighborhood. Earlier, one of the results was a young lady came by and she was inquiring about how we, she, it's specifically about the heart to heart pamphlet. And so, Brother McLean, it was a good idea that we circulate those and we send them to, the, to all, the, all the surrounding neighbors and they can come to know and then they'll ask a question, what must I do? And we wanna provide that service. Just helps that it, it, it is a resource, it is a resource that requires finances. So that's pay, the Lord has provided that. So we wanna thank God for that, for that outreach that he has given to the leaders and to the church. Let us go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for monies. We thank you. We know that finances are necessary. Finances are not required for soul salvation, but we need it to, to reach out and to save souls in this area. God, we thank you for the energies and the blessings and the jobs and the, and, and the abilities of some of our members to earn resources. And then, God, we thank you for the willingness to give back a portion of what you've given to us. We thank you for spiritual giving. Help us now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Let us all say, Amen. Amen. As we meet other, other visits and guests among us, please stand. Please stand that we may acknowledge you, may receive you, may welcome you. Yes. Amen. Could, we, could I ask, if you don't mind, can I have your names? Amen. Amen. You are so welcome. <laughs> you are, you are our, our honored guests, and we just pray that you'll come back and worship together with us again. I pray that through the message, your, your, your inquiries have been engendered and, and you can ask a question if there is something that you must have. We just pray that God has sent his word and sent his message to you through our minister. Thank you for coming once again. Uh, please, please let us stand as we prepare for our dismissal of prayer. Okay. Uh, just a reminder, um, the, 
the, the women's ladies class on this um, this afternoon it starts at, at five o'clock. Brother Donald mentioned that earlier. Um, there's some information on how you can connect to that on Zoom uh, on the table where you pick up your communion packets at. Again, that's the ladies class. Men, we don't need you in that. Uh, don't need you in that class. Sister Doris Smith is doing an outstanding, outstanding job from what I what I hear. This is her second uh, second month teaching that. Sister Smith, we thank you. Thank you so much for lending yourself to 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 that uh, to that to that cause. Uh, if there is nothing else, let's be singing a verse of He's He's my King. All day long of Jesus, I am singing. Uh, he's my song of joy will ever be. All the while he keeps my heart's bells ringing uh, for his love is everything to me well he's my king and oh I dearly love him uh, he's my king no other is above him all day long in rapture praise I sing he's my savior he's my king let us go to God in prayer father thank you for all the spiritual things you've allowed us to do today thank you for your love that you've revealed to us through your son and for the love that we share together as your Christian body. We are thankful for all the words you've sown into our hearts this day through your manservant. Yes. It is our prayer that through your spirit that they take root and bear fruit. We pray that all who have requested and are in need of prayer receive the blessings according to your will. We ask that you especially comfort those who have suffered bereavement. Now as we leave this service, we pray that you will walk with us. May we be alert to your spiritual guidance as we go about our daily lives and be good stewards of your grace and mercy. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. amen.